Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way you meet us through music. Thank you for the, or the joy that we experience when we're in your presence and, Lord, when we are together with our church family. We ask that, Lord, that we would continue this celebration as we open up your word and hear what you would have for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so when a marketing agency wants to draw your attention to a new product, wants you to say, this is something I need in my life, they will use words like something is new. Something is improved. Something has been revised. And if you've not taken time, next time you go to the grocery store, walk down the aisle and see, you know, things like new formula, new recipe, new packaging. Well, we're about six years into this whole parenting thing or approaching that point, And we are still looking for help, Caitlin and I, on raising our three children. One book that caught our eye was this. Have a new kid by Friday. (laughs) How to change your child's attitude, behavior, and character in five days. And there is a follow-up. We're not quite there. How to have a new teenager by Friday from mouthy and moody to respectful and responsible in five days. When Caitlin and I were preparing for marriage, we read a number of books. And one of the books that we, um, we looked at together was a book called Getting Ready for Marriage. But I, I wanted to zoom in on the top of the book because it is the revised version. <laughs> that sure says a lot, doesn't it? So something happened between the first printing and the revised. I went back and did some research. This is actually the sixth printing. (laughs) But what made this one the revised version is that the author died and his wife went back and revised it. I guess she had a lot more to say. I don't know. (laughs) Well, when Jesus walked the earth, one of the complaints from the religious community that Jesus was was changing the old ways, that he was doing something new. And that made people really uneasy. In fact, it made some people really angry. And it was one of the things that led to Jesus' crucifixion. As a church, we are studying the life of the most remarkable person who ever lived, the person of Jesus Christ. And we believe that his life was not only world-altering, but it's life-changing. And we are looking at this account of Jesus' life through the lens of a man named Luke. Luke was, from what we know, a physician. He was a doctor. So each week, we are looking to hear good news from the doctor. Now, last week... Luke shared with us about how Jesus called a tax collector named Levi to be one of his disciples, one of his followers. And at that time, rabbis did not um, pick their disciples, but potential disciples came to them and said, Rabbi, I believe I have what it takes to be your disciple. But Jesus, Jesus was very different than other rabbis, and he did some new things. Instead of waiting for people to approach him, he approached them. And what's crazy is that Jesus approaches the person who is the least likely. Nobody in town, much less another rabbi, would ever have chosen a tax collector named Levi to be their disciple. You see, Levi was known by his family, his friends, and even the Romans as a greedy sellout. Yet Jesus, he invites him to be a disciple and welcomes him in to his his group of disciples who are, in a lot of ways, a variety of their day. Political and religious opposites. People like Levi, Levi worked and was supported by Rome. He actually supported Rome. And others like Simon, who was a zealot, he hated Rome and despised anyone, even fellow Jews, who sought any peace 
with who he saw as these Roman oppressors. But Jesus was not just doing a new thing in calling these people together, but he was doing a new thing in each of their lives. We heard last week Levi is invited to really leave his former ways of working against God's people and to live into his identity, his true identity, as Matthew, a gift for God's people. So here's Levi. Levi is welcomed in to this group. Levi leaves his tax collecting business and he's so excited about what Jesus has invited him into. He throws a huge party and there's Matthew. There are some other social and religious outcasts who have come to this party. There's Jesus at the party and some of Jesus' disciples. And the religious leaders of the day, they look at Jesus, they look at Jesus' disciples, and they're very confused, right? Jesus and his disciples don't fit the mold of what they're used to. They're very different than the other religious people of their day. They had fun. They celebrated. They were okay being with people who did not fit into the nice religious box that was expected. So the religious leaders approach Jesus, approach the disciples, and they begin to ask questions. So they say, you know, you know, John, you know, your cousin, you know, John the Baptist, you know, his disciples, they, they fast and pray a lot. And so do, the, so do the disciples of other Pharisees. But yours, yours go on eating and drinking. See, Jesus' followers seem to break from the norm of their tradition. And for many re- religious leaders, their faith was anchored in tradition and in these systemized um, religious practices. One thing they did is they, they would fast twice a week. These are the religious leaders. And to show how spiritual they were, right, how serious they were about really suffering for God by, pa- by fasting, they would put white powder on their face to make them look a little sickly. Now, they only had to fast from sunrise to sunset. I mean, people do that now on purpose. (laughs) And the rest of the time, they could eat whatever they wanted. And what they were doing, they were putting on a show to express how religious they were, how much better they were than others. And even the prayer life of many Pharisees was ritualistic. You know, the, the expectation of the day was at three different times, noon, At three and at six, you would stop whatever you were doing and you would kneel and you would pray. Now, there are some there are some wonderful things, beautiful things about spiritual disciplines. But many of the religious leaders were doing them to try to impress people. Some were doing them just merely out of obligation, and most of them were doing it to try to impress God. They were trying to say, God, I'm going to do all these things to show you that I'm good enough for your love, that I'm good enough, that I'm, I'm obeying your rules. So the Pharisees, they questioned Jesus. Your disciples look like they're having fun all of the time. They're always celebrating, and they are not taking the tradition. They are not taking our ritual seriously. And Jesus says, Hey, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? In other words, Jesus says, hey, you ever been to a wedding? Weddings are celebrations. Weddings are fun. And right now, it's time to party because God is doing some amazing things through me. I am the groom who is here for his bride. And through me, God is ushering in a new season. He is ushering in a new kingdom to do battle against evil. And he's doing a new thing to redeem his people. Now, to understand a little bit more context, at this time when you got married, you did not go away for a honeymoon. But you stayed around the community and for a week there would be parties every night to celebrate you and your spouse being married. And Jesus is saying to the religious people, God's people have been waiting for years for this moment, waiting for God to show up. And that time is right now. This is the time to celebrate all that God is doing through me. It's not the time to be sad. It's not the time to, be, to mourn. But it is a time to be joyful that I am here for my people, 
that I am here to bring my bride back, that I am here to establish a new kingdom. I'm here to set things straight. I'm here for those who have felt far from God, like they've never been able to measure up. I'm here for those who have questions about where God is in all of this. And I'm inviting you, I'm inviting them to come close and to enjoy God's presence. Each of you are invited to experience something new and something joyful. But Jesus says, look, there's going to be a time when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And in those days, they will fast. Eventually, the bridegroom groom will, will have to leave. And right here, we have the first time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is looking ahead to his crucifixion. He knows it's coming. And when it happens, there will be fasting, right? There will be mourning. There will be grieving. Yet in, even in the midst of that grief, you know what Jesus will later tell us? There will be rejoicing. And it's a joy that we will experience that will never be taken away again. I wonder how many of us miss out on the joy of the Lord, miss out on all that Jesus offers us. How many of us miss out? Because we settle for trying to just add a little bit of Jesus to our lives. See, it's not about adding a little more religion. It's not even about adding a little more Jesus because God is not interested in just improving us. God is not interested in us just having a little nicer life. But he has come in the person of Jesus to do something new, to completely transform us. Right? He does it with Levi, a tax collector who felt unseen, he felt worthless. He was taking advantage of his own people. He was transformed into Matthew, right? A gift of God for God and for God's people. In fact, a gift for us, the book of Matthew. The book that begins our New Testament was written by the former Levi. He did it with Simon Peter, a fisherman, transformed into a fisher of men, a rock who God will, will raise up to lead the church, and he wants to do it for the religious leaders who try to find life in attempting to obey God's law, trying to be good enough rather than finding their hope, finding their peace in the grace of God. And he wants to do it with us. And then Jesus will go on. He'll use these parables. Parables are earthly stories with these heavenly truths. And he uses them to explain about this change that he's coming to bring. He told them in this parable, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new one will not match the old. All right, you know this, right? If you add a new patch to an old garment, as soon as you wash it and you dry it, the new fabric will shrink and whatever hole you had will become worse. See, the religious people of the day, they believed that the key to life, to happiness, to holiness, to being right with God was in obeying God's law. And if they could just obey God's law, God would approve of them in their lives. They would be good. But Jesus comes and says, your best will never be good enough. And you know it because you're not perfect. And unless you're perfect, you will not match up to God's standards. So I don't want you just to patch up your old lives. I want to give you something better. I want to offer you something that you do not have to earn. I want to give you my righteousness. Righteousness is another word that means right standing before God. I want God to look at you the same way he looks at me. Jesus is saying, I want God to look at you the same way that he looks at me. The same way that I, Andrew, was beaming the other night as my five-year-old daughter stood up here and graduated from Adam Lamb Preschool. <laughs> the same way that you stand up and cheer for your children and grandchildren when they walk across the stage at their graduation. 
And here's Jesus. Stop wasting your time trying to get yourself right on your own. A patch, a tweak, a small shift is not enough. The sin in the world, the evil in the world is, all, is too all-encompassing. You don't need a hymn. You don't need to be sewed back up. You need a new outfit. And trusting in my goodness, in my perfection, and in my love for you is all you need. And then Jesus tells this second parable. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. When you made wine, you would take the grape juice, you would add some yeast, and you would seal it in an animal skin container. And of course, as the fermentation began, the the wine would expand, and the wine was good. But if you take new wine and put it into old wineskins that don't have an ability to stretch, the wineskins would burst, and it's all ruined. And Jesus once again saying, you just can't add me to your life. You can't just add me into your current religious system. But I have come to bring something that is brand new. And it will not work with how you've done things before. And think about this, right? Our God is all about doing new things. He began a new thing when he made Adam and Eve. And when that didn't go so well, Right, he did a new thing with Noah and his family, right? And when God's people needed an identity, he raised up a, he did, he raised up a new family through Abraham. And when God's people needed leadership, he raised up new judges. And eventually, he raised up a group of kings because what the judges were providing was not sufficient. And today, we celebrate with churches all over the world and throughout time, Pentecost Sunday, where God once again did a new thing. That's why Pentecost is the church's birthday, where the Holy Spirit, God's presence and power, came into, the, into Christ's followers and unleashed them into the world. And you and I, Darden Church, we are a product of Pentecost. Now, before Pentecost... The Holy Spirit would come into a person for a specific time or a specific purpose, but it would always be temporary. Eventually, the Holy Spirit would depart. But at Pentecost, what we learn is the Holy Spirit comes and makes its home in those who have committed their lives to Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit does not leave. He came into this incredibly diverse group of believers And he unified them, gave them a love for one another, a love for God, and a love for God's mission. And he's never left. And just as God calls us with different gifts and from different walks of life to move from being individuals to being the body of Christ, continuing his mission in the world, that same spirit is working to transform you. And why? Because the old you is incompatible with the new thing that God wants to do in you. The old you, the way you think, the way you treated people, the way you responded, the way you understood God is incompatible with the new thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do in you. That's why Jesus is not just a patch that we can add to our lives. It's not just, I'm just going to come to church. It's not... I'm going to turn to God when things are tough. Or I'm going to seek um, some religion to make me a better person. But when you place your faith, your, your, your trust in Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, and you turn your life over to him, you submit your life to him, he gets to work. And he begins to completely overhaul us. Paul says, look, because the old you is incompatible with the new you that Jesus wants you to become, says the way you've been living, going along with the crowd, living without God at the center, that's no life for you. You learned Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, 
We do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything connected with the old way of life, has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. Another place, Paul will tell us that we have been crucified with Christ. You know what that means? We have been put, the old self has been put to death and God is doing something new in us. So then, take on an entirely new way of life. A God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct is God accurately reproduces his character, right? Listen, his character in you. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life. Making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. But make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Be gentle with one another. Be sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. Look, it should be obvious that Christ is living in you by how you do your job, how you treat your spouse, how you live out your singleness, or how you parent your children. It should be evident in how you respond, what you think, even, even how you feel will be a direct outpouring from your relationship with Jesus. This is who you are from now on. Your essential identity, your new nature in action. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, we, began to, we begin to take off right our old way of living, of thinking, But we need the Holy Spirit to help us. Because why? Because you and I have gotten really comfortable with how we're living. Right? We need help because we were often raised in families and sometimes in churches where thinking and responding in a certain unchristlike way was the norm. We sometimes have friends in our lives who support our sins rather than lead us to Christ. And we need the help of the Holy Spirit because time after time, we believe the lies that God's ways are not best. These changes, these changes are very difficult. But God, God has so much better for us. He's got better clothes for us, right? He's got better things in store for us. Things that give us hope. Things that give us help. Things that give us healing. And you and I were made for more. Made for something greater. So that means in every situation, in every location, in every relationship, your life, the whole, um, uh, of, of our lives, the Holy Spirit is employing people, places, and things as tools of God's transforming power. God does not rest. He does not leave the work. But he's active. He takes no breaks. He is relentlessly working to change you and I. And he will not be content for us to become a little bit better. But because Christ lives in us, his spirit is in us, he will only settle for our complete transformation. I want you to take a minute. And we're going to sit quietly. And I want you to think about what are the sounds that you hear. Let's do that real quick. hear kind of the buzz of the speakers listen carefully you might hear a car go by or a bird outside when it's real quiet you hear yourself breathing and others breathing and the room might feel very quiet like there's not much going on but it is far from that in fact let me show you right let's say I bring out a little radio I pull my radio out There's more going on in this space than what we often hear, right? It's always risky tuning into a random station. You see, this room is far from quiet, 
But it's not this, this, this receiver, this radio is not producing that, like it's not creating that sound. It didn't design that program. All it's doing is receiving, right, some of the radio waves that are bouncing back and forth in this room. And it is taking it through the antenna and it is magnifying it through these speakers. This is what happens with the Holy Spirit. It is constantly speaking to you, trying to get your attention, trying to work to transform you. And the Holy Spirit speaking through things like God's word, through the Bible. It speaks through one another. It speaks when we are um, out and about, seeking to transform us and mold us as we go through the events of our day. And it, is, it loves to speak to us when we are intentional about being quiet. When we are in a posture of prayer where we're saying, Holy Spirit, I need you to direct me, to guide me. I need to hear from you. The problem is we are really bad at tuning in and listening, aren't we? We let so many other things distract us. We let the noise drown out what God might be speaking to us. But here's the deal. God is active in the world. God is active in our lives. He's always doing new things, and he will use every opportunity to transform us. Jesus, excuse me, Jesus does a new thing as he goes about his ministry, transforming how people saw and experienced our Heavenly Father. Jesus did a new thing at Easter, transforming death from a thing to fear to merely a shadow. Jesus did a new thing at Pentecost as the Holy Spirit gave the world a, and, and his disciples a new vision, not only for what the people of God looks like, but how they live into that mission. And that means we as a church, we are not deterred when someone says the seven deadly words that some churches struggle with. We've never done it that way before. <laughs> right? See, we take orders from a God who loves to do new things, who loves to reach new people. Now, the Bible will remain the basis for how we live, for what we teach, for how we, how we love, because it is God's very word to us. And it is, like people, the only thing that is eternal. But the ways we meet people, the technology we use, the music, the renovations of our building, the refreshing of our campus— our models of ministry will continue to adapt because our mission is more important than our individual models or our individual programs. And just as the Lord wants to do a new thing in the world and constantly call the church to do new things, he wants to do a new thing in you. So what do you have to take off? What is it today that you think, this is keeping me from experiencing the fullness of life that God offers? What do we need to put aside? What needs to come to an end so that God can do a new thing in you? How might you, after taking that, putting it aside, open your life up to the transforming work of the Holy Spirit? One powerful way you can do that, it's a simple exercise, is to spend two minutes in quiet, listening for the Holy Spirit to nudge you to speak to you, to work in your heart. And why this is so important, why this message of Jesus is so important, it not just affects the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father, but the greatest gift that you can give to the people in your life is God's presence working in you. It is the transformed you that God wants to use to bless this world and to bless others. It is being the parent, the child, the friend, the coworker who reflects the love and grace of God to the world. It's the person guided by the Holy Spirit that seeks to submit to God's best, even when it's costly. That seeks to know and believe and live into their true identity as God's child. A person who lives without fear, without anxiety, without worry. It's the person, the version of you that God is transforming into the image of his son. You and I, you and I can rest assured that where change is needed in your life 
and in my life, there is a God of grace who knows just, what ne- just where that change needs to take place and offers you everything you need so that you can make it happen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus into our world to show us a new way of seeing you. So much of how we viewed you was through the lens of judgment, through the lens of you not being concerned, from the lens of you being distant, but that's not the truth, that Jesus came to show us that, that God, you, are, you intimately care about us as, as, as your creations, that you, you care about what we are experiencing. You desire so much better for us than what we tend to settle for. God, may, might you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, make your lives in our, make your, excuse me, your presence in our lives. If there are places in our life that we have not given over to you, may we do that this morning. If it means for the first time placing our trust in the life, death, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, who came to live the life that we should have lived, that we can't live, to die the death that we should have died, so that we might be covered by your righteousness, your gift of right living. May that happen this morning. We thank you that, Lord, you are not done with us. May you continue to give us wisdom. May you give us, Lord, the power. And may you work in powerful ways as you seek to transform us from the inside out so that we reflect you, your love, and your character to one another in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.